This is Science Scholarship Hub organizing U.S. universities for application processes. And so we have our two main speakers for today. I have the person of Habib or Nemesi Abdulaziz. And we also have our second speaker who is Favor Mose. Favor Mose. I feel like I can hear some clappings in my ears. Like, oh. okay, Favor, take it away from us and shoot. Hello. So I'm Favor. Okay. And there's a little bit of a mistake here. I did that the first class. So I'm going to be talking more about research parts and how to get a PI and how to get into a lab of your choice. Well, a page is today. So page is all about getting a PI and getting into a lab. So I think, okay. So we started first of all from searching for PIs. How do you search for PIs? I know that. Whether I will all like wanted to get into either a master's program or a PhD program, and most of the schools in the US ask you to have like a supervisor that that's most of the requirements when to get funding. So this is one of the major criteria in applying for schools. So how do you search for those supervisors or those PIs? Is how that was gonna make a difference. So there are different places where you can search for PIs. Your Twitter should not just be about dragging VTM and the rest. Yes, yeah, so your Twitter is one place. Like almost all professors, they have a Twitter handle. All professors. So you have to make your Twitter professional. So you have to make it not just posting about money to make it professional and then try to fine tune your search. You know how the whole algorithm works. If your Twitter algorithm is right, you tend to see more of these people popping up on your on your on your like story field than the the other people that you don't really need. And that place you can actually search for PIs or supervisors is on LinkedIn. Yeah. So if you don't have a LinkedIn account here, yeah, you are wrong. You are wrong. So you need to have a LinkedIn account that is up to date. A LinkedIn account that shows what and like it shows that you what kind of research you are interested in. So other places is still searching, just searching. So if you go on Twitter, most of these bodies, most of these um, professors, they have their own Twitter accounts, and then there are some publication bodies that you can look out for. We, we know of nature, share reports, E Life and the rest, so those top journals. So they publish about professors on a daily, like constantly. So you can go through those things and see, okay, which of the professors are in my field. Then that's because now you need to like be able to get a lot of professors that are within your field. It's nice to take professors within your field of what you are intended to do. But then once you do that, then it's all about you sending the code mail. So a code mail is an email just introducing yourself. But not, not introducing the fact that you are from Nigeria, no. Just the fact that, okay, I've done this particular research, I'm interested in this particular research, and I feel that whatever you are doing in your lab is what is my interest. And I have what it takes to help you out, or what it takes to continue with this particular research being done in your lab. So that is a code mail. So code mail is meant to it highlight your spec, like highlight the, the good things about you, like the, the things about you in terms of your research. And then you also attach your CV and your transcripts to a, a code mail. So a code mail, you, you are not also inviting them to like interview you. But sometimes because of how many um, emails they get, they don't tend to they don't tend to like um, reply. One thing that helped me during my period was that I use I use um, Twitter a lot, so I would always like stop them. I'm sorry, but I stopped them. Right? So I stop them on Twitter and see like comments on their because they make references on their research on, on on their Twitter. So I go about like just liking their posts, commenting, and then some some of them they are. 
their, their um, chat box is open. So go ahead to send them a message on either Twitter or LinkedIn. And I like, introduce myself that, hey, I like your research, I like your lab, and I would want to work with you. And before you can do that, you have to make sure that you understand what that person is doing. You understand the research that person is doing. If not, you you end up sending a generic message, or a generic email, and then you end up shooting yourself in your leg. I want you to understand that just as we as all individuals, our interests change sometimes. Even though as a PI, their interests might have changed over the course of years. So you don't just start reading papers from 1999 and expect 1999 to be the same as you do. So when you see a peer that you like, a professor that you, that you want to work with, you have to go ahead to look for the person's papers, recent publications, this year, last year, recent publications, and look at it, okay, is there a difference? Because most times, even if they are the first world country and everything is about the mistake and everything, sometimes they are not really up to date in, like, Changing stuff in, on their website. So some of the information there that are on their school websites are outdated. So it's your duty to so it's your duty to go ahead to check at all these publications with this thing, their Google Scholar account, their um research gates account to see their latest papers. And then to be able to write your your code emails to find two the latest papers. Do you see? And then it's always good, everybody likes attention. It's always good that you are coming in or you are sending an email with a good understanding of your of their research. That shows that yes, you you are very much interested in what they do. Like during my own time, I I I, I didn't stop just reading their papers. I went ahead to like check their last conferences they attended, which of their students presented in the conferences. So this is that this particular person is a scholar. Particular person is willing to do research. Particular person knows what I want and what I what I want and is ready to do it. So this way, you have to show interest, make your, your and please, I wonder that it is something of a new, a new way, but try as possible as to avoid ChatGPT. They tend to frown or like, oh, this is a generic email. Like I was speaking with one, of, one uh, professor here, I was like, oh, we got, get a lot of emails from social, social people in certain countries. But when they look at it, like, ah, this is different than not know me. So you see, so they know, they read those emails. They read, almost all of them read those emails, but it's the email, something that stands out to them. That's what makes a difference. And then some of them read that emails and forget. So it's your own duty to always send a reminder. So a reminder should be sent probably after two weeks of no reply from them. You send a reminder to see if they're still with you or not with you. And another place, another one is that you can also reach out to them on TikTok. On um, sorry, not TikTok, on Twitter. So I'm a doctor professor on 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 um on LinkedIn. I'm a doctor professor that I reached out. I sent him a reminder twice, and he did not reply. So I reached out to him on Twitter, and I saw from his post that his daughter was not feeling fine. So what I did was that my my next email. I sent him and I asked specifically, how is your data? How was the surgery? And he replied me. So you that means that, that like, oh, you like, oh, you know about my data. And I'm like, yes, I saw your post. So you need to be very, very much vast about how you search and make it very, very specific to them to so show that, okay, this person is interested in my work. So that's what I'm going to talk about is connecting with mentors. Uh, professors for recommendations. Recommendation data is, a, is vital, one of the most important things about application um, procedures. And where's your recommender? If you're coming for a master's program, you normally ask for two recommendations from, from your supervisor or from your lecturer. With a PhD, PhD mostly asks for three recommendations. 
So it's advice that is recommended should be people that know you very much and can attest to whatever you are doing. I know some people here will like, oh, the person should have a professor or this. No. If that person that knows you very much is an assistant professor or, or assistant lecturer that can write three pages of reference, please take that person over someone that will just write, she's a good girl. Nobody knows, nobody cares whether you're a good girl. Everybody wants to do, you want to know your capability. So if someone that is just with the assistant lecturer one will write you a three reference, three pages reference, and is detailed and specific to you, please go after that person that so that to just write one pages reference because he or she is the professor. So I know that, that when I was applying, they were like, oh, you need to have a professor, like a full time professor as a, as a reference. No, you need to have someone that can recommend you clearly. I can, rec I can recommend you very well. And then how do you get your, your mentors and professors for you to, to, for you to recommend? You know, most of us who have these are enemies or kind of kind of feeling that like, oh our professors are against us or something like that. No. You need to make sure that you have a cordial relationship with your lecturer. So if you are in school right now, this is the time for you to build that cordial relationship with your lecturers. Nobody's out there to get you. Nobody's really out there to get you. So you need to have that cordial relationship with them. And then sometimes we know it's, this period is like there's um, um a lot of on the days we are like Send them a message, oh, how are you doing, sir? How is your family? Oh, how are you doing, man? Like, check up on them once, once in a while. This helps them to have, still, like, to still have you in their mind so that whatever they have seen about you doesn't, like, whatever they have known you for doesn't fade. So that your, your, your face still remains fresh in the memory where you constantly check up on them. Come slowly. To that person, like, oh, sir, or my, I want you to be my recommender. I want to apply for schools in the US or UK, and I would like you to be my recommendation to write a question letter. So, that is one thing. And then to look at the person that is wanting or is willing to write for you. And although they say two, two referees, it is always nice for you to have backup reference because you cannot, even if you know that the professor is nice and everything, but you cannot attest to in that at that time. They will be busy or something unimaginable could happen where we are we live in Nigeria. So they could be issued with data, they could be issued with uh, NEPA, not big lives, or his laptop being lost, or laptop being bad, anything like that. Yeah. So you don't, in that case, you have a deadline for your reference by December 3rd, and then by December 2nd, Kashima have born in wherever I stay. That's not going to be bad. So you need to have a backup reference. But you should have backup recommenders. I had five recommenders, five to six recommenders. So if anyone starts telling me that they're not feeling fine, let's go, Mr. Be fine, Joe. Don't worry, sir. Take care of yourself. See you in this application. You see, so you need to have a lot of recommenders, and each of them should not be recommending or saying the same specific things about you. Yeah. So that is one thing about your information. Like, what I always advise people that each recommender should speak. 16 things about you. Once you come in from the avenue of you being a good researcher, you possessing the skills that is needed in the lab. So it's advisable that one should be your supervisor. And this person here should highlight how up to date you are with your, with your research, how you can work independently. Independently is one of the important features of PhD and master's research, because they know that, in, like in, for me, in PhD research, we are the ones that could come up with a plus of our research and everything. So you should have someone that, it's that, to, that to recommend you as someone that can work independently. And that is one goal of one of, the, of, your, of your recommenders. But the current, your second recommender should recommend you in the terms of academic and leadership. Leadership in the sense that in a PhD and a master's, you would have undergraduates, you would have lab techs, you would also have fellow students. So they need to see that you have the leadership qualities 
for summer internship people that are coming. I'm going to say that they're just on uh, LCNL um, um, research programs. So, and then your academic, because first time you'll be teaching, you're either a GTA or a GRA, and GTA is most common. So they need to know that she has, or he, he has a good academic standard. Yeah, You're, so someone should be able to clearly explain or narrate your academic powers. The next person, if it's a three recommender, the next person to talk about your teaching experiences. Any sign that you start, you are teaching, maybe you did, you 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 have some, um, what we call it in Nigeria, the tutorial sessions for other for for junior students. So someone should be there to recommend your teaching experiences. Like for me during my during my during my time, I I didn't teach while I was in Nigeria. Not really like I didn't do it. I was a group uh, lab leader. So that person recommended me on that aspect that I'm a group lab leader. Because I have a good ability working as a leader, as a team lead, and teaching. So they should be able to recommend you as a good teacher. And then if that possible, that person, that person has also recommended you as a good teacher, they also recommend you in terms of extracurricular activities. I was able to recommend her as extracurricular activities. If he says that oh, she's, oh, he or she was also involved, in some saving parts on the road or, or cleaning the good towns and it's like something that shows that not only are you good in the academic field, but you also like to give back to the society. So that is the three aspect. So now this is that in you although you have three recommenders, no one person is taking the same thing about you. And it's giving them a more detailed information about you. Yeah, so because you, you cannot say everything in your SOP, but now they know a lot about your job because your recommenders have talked a lot and different aspects about you. So that is that. I'm going to move over to the next slide because of time. Starting for targeted research programs. So, you know, okay, for targeted research programs, how is that being done? You need to first of all search for labs and then search you go online. Okay. Online. I use usnews.com and I and I, I, I always advise people to use usnews.com. We use usnews.com to search for schools, programs that have specific research interests that you, 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 you want to do. So you could use US News there, and then you can also just search on Google search. Okay. Labs that are into this, or schools that have research in this, just as simple as that. So when you do that, you there you see a lot of information. So US News is the best when it comes to educational related stuff. Everything about US is there. So US News helps you to search for research labs. Yeah, and then another way to search for research lab is searching for conferences. There's conferences in microbiology. It's conversely in every research area. So if you have a lot of conferences in the research area, you see labs of people that post to those conferences. You don't go to a conference if you're not under that research area. That's not about US here. Because your students are going to give you that kind of travel funds to go there. So you can either search US News, normal Google search, niche.com is another place, niche.com is another place where you to search for schools and research that are existing. And then Conferences. There's many conference bodies, ASM, there's a lot of them that you can search for. And then when you go to them, you will have a numerous information about this research um, lab that I specific. So that way, you can either know where to apply to or who to apply to. And what I always advise is that. If you apply, not just because, like me, I did power chemistry in my undergraduate. So my research interest might not just be under the power chemistry of the social school, like Podio or, or my school, UTA. So 
If I search for my research interest, I can find this somewhere in molecular biology, computational biology, or what other uh, program name. So when you're actually applying to a graduate school, most times you're applying to the research and not just the program name. So the research is based on what the people in that, that particular program are doing. So when I was applying, I was searching based on the research interest and I had to go through the ASM and other, uh, uh, other conferences to find these people that are doing this. So I did not care if coming as a biochemist, but I was, I was interested in uh, genetics. I did not care if there was someone doing genetics or an person is not doing it on that biochemistry department. No, I will apply to that program. As far as I have what it takes in terms of my SAP's right to be aligned to that program, and I have someone that I would love to work with in that program. So you you can be you, you can be studying biology right now, and you see someone that has your research interest in chemistry. Go ahead and apply. So that is how you apply to US because you, you're not confined by program name. You are confined to the research, what has been done in that particular program, and then the coursework. So you are either applying if you like the research or you like the coursework. They say that the coursework that's been done in that program will give you the experiences you want or whatever you want. But in terms of a PhD student, you are applying based on your research. Yes, so you can find your research interest in biology or something very, very different, a program name very much different from whatever you study during your undergraduate. They don't really care about your program name. They only care about if you have the, the the related coursework and if you have the related research experiences. So I hope I'm making sense. Yeah. The, the next part I want to talk about is how to ace your research interviews. How to ace your research interviews. So okay. so first of all interviews, yeah, I did a bunch of them. They were coming and I've I've been I'm going to defend mock interviews for people who are coming in this year. Yeah. So, so that first of all, I'll talk about you cannot say that you know a certain technique in your SOP or in your CV. You put it, okay. I, I want to speak from a biology aspect now because, uh, or because another person, you cannot say that you know how to do mass spectrometer, uh, mass uh, 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 spectrometer or you have to do PCR. And then you cannot explain it to someone. You cannot put it in your CV, your CV there that experience this, uh, experience this, that, this, that, this, that. And you don't know how to explain to someone. I know that most of people that, most of people are out there that will just put things there that will just because of aesthetic, just because to make up, oh, I know this, I know that, but you don't know it. Yeah, we know that Nigeria schools in terms of research were not just the best. But if you put something in your SOP in terms of a practical experimental skills, it is best advised that you go online. YouTube, YouTube has every information, even the ones that we don't need. So you can go online YouTube and look for videos on someone or one other school or whatever doing that experiment and watch it like. Watch them need to like study it. And the last time I had um an interview prep with somebody and as a person, you put in your CV, you have the PCR. Like, Please explain PCR. But I, um, um, I okay now I give you this duty. When after this interview, please go uh, go online and study about PCR, like watch YouTube videos about PCR. And the person felt like I wasn't being serious about that. So the person did not study about PCR. And guess what happened? You need to say that you have to that question. How do you do PCR? He did not study it. And yeah, it was a flop. It was a flop. Because you cannot be you cannot say you're coming for research and you don't you don't have to do PCR. And you put it in your CV and you can do PCR. So when we finish the meeting, he called me and I said, are you rich? I'm like, this is the basic thing. Any skills that you're putting in, 
You're putting Python program, you're putting R, you're putting anything you're putting in your CV. Be sure that they might ask you that during your interview. But the least you can do is Coursera is there. I use a lot of Coursera during my period. Like I, I passed Coursera courses on my head then. Because uh, there were a lot of skills I did not know. I, I needed to learn it. So I used Coursera to learn the theoretical aspects. I went for conferences. Many conferences, science conferences in, around Nigeria. So I went to a lot of them during my period of applying. Because I was going there not only to have things to put in my SOP, but to also experience these practical or hands-on experimental procedures. So, there, so you need to gather the experiences that you need because you don't know where they're going to throw you questions from. And just because you put it there that you know PCR or you know anything or you know MATLAB or you know machine learning, and I just want to ask you, you don't know if that is one of the specific reasons they are picking you or they want to interview you for. So if you want to start with your research, if, if you have an interview, first of all, anything, any technique you put there, any skills that you put in your skill session, please have at least basic level to intermediate level of understanding or knowledge on that particular skills that you have written in your SOP or in your CV. Then how to how to ask your research interviews? First of all, you need to be as calm as possible. You need to be as calm as possible. They're not out there to finish you. And you need to like prepare as much as possible. Have your first draft of your answers of your replies. Then you are, you have people that are helping you out in your application. Or people that are, that are mentoring you have to have a mock interview with them. And take their advice into to heart, like take their advice, do whatever they said you should do. Like take it to heart, make those corrections. Yeah. And then read the papers of these people that you that are interviewing you. And then just pray and go ahead. Like and don't like when you are very much prepared for an interview, then you have nothing else to do. Like and, and then don't I don't allow them. To ask you a question. If it was possible, like to share your answers for the next question while talking. Please do it. And, like during my interview, I was I was like three two questions in one question. So at the point we had like 30 minutes left, and there was nothing left to discuss. There was no point, there was no there was no question about oh, so how are you doing? I'm fine, sir. How is the family? So you need to be bored as possible, you need to know your onion. You need to give them what they want. Yeah. Like, you need to like, okay, this, uh, you know what they want. So, you need to have, that in, in a nutshell, you need to practice a lot for you to have, for, for any research interview or any interview, be it your visa interview, you need to practice a lot for that interview. So, let's go to the next point because of time. Keep focusing on SOP. So, what's an SOP? So, SOP is, is a element of purpose. So once you keep focus on your SOP, your SOP should first of all start with, I always tell people to start with, each paragraph should have what it's talking about. So I always advise that the first paragraph should start with a, a rhetorical question. Something eye-catching that will keep them glued to their seat to continue reading whatever you have to listen to. Don't start with a weak line that in Nigeria, this, nah. But not but that with a weak line that, oh, as the first doctor of my family, they don't care. Don't come out through it, any emotional jargons here. Yeah. No. They start with a rhetorical question that is based on your application, based on what particular field you are coming into. So you could come trying to profess a solution that we all know that it's not a solution. Because it doesn't start to start with a fact that is well known. Yeah. Like, because, so that fact of, of, the, of the typical question should be a problem that you want to address with you coming into that program. So you could, you could, you could start that, oh, global warming, can you come? You could start that, oh, the heat, the rate of heat damage or people dying with heat, Christian, this thing, this thing, this thing. You are wondering if this, now you're professing a solution that you might not just be a solution. 
if this will help this. Then this particular field, this particular question is what I would love to address by studying a PhD in this in your institution. Now, you are coming in with a simple question that is strong enough to show them that you understand the big picture. You show you have the big picture in, like, in front of you, and then you have something you want to offer. So this is, this is the big picture you want to address. And then your next paragraph should be about academic academic in terms of your course, your coursework. Next paragraph, your undergraduate research. What kind of research have you done? So this is each paragraph should talk about specific things. And if you're talking about an academic, you have to go ahead to see that some schools that make mention of important coursework criteria that they look after. So if they put that, okay, Cost in MATLAB is important. Me, I'm going to put, I did a cost in MATLAB in that SOP. So you put those, you have to look at your application write out and everything for you to be able to align your SOP. So just like what, what the first writer said, your SOP should be specific to each school. So from your first paragraph, you will try out a specific point that they're looking for. So your first paragraph, they're looking for someone that's addressing what concept, what particular problem in the world. You try it in there. Second paragraph, particular coursework, like they say that is that is important. You try it in there. So you need to read your website very well for you to be able to arrange your SOPs to fit into to fit into whatever they do. So they don't have to look forward to to start stressing themselves. They have, you have everything for every question. So, so your SOP is like you asking that questions. You need to answer all the questions that they are asking here. And then your next paragraph, your third paragraph will be your research, teaching experiences, and then everything. And then your last paragraph is another key paragraph. Your last paragraph should, yeah, you need to specifically identify people you want to work with. So in the first paragraph, in the first um, when at the first part I, I took, I talked about how to get a professor. So if we are causing a professor, there, you know, this, this is the time for us to talk about the professor. That's all. Oh, one of the key details of me, or oh, 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 one of the one of the reasons I choose to apply to your school was because of the work of Dr. Chang or Dr. Wei. I saw Dr. Wei doing this on this, and I want to continue in further research. I think that Dr. Wei's research is going to be like this and this and that. So even if that particular person has not replied to you, yeah, you can put that in. If you need to mention three particular professors or two of the particular professors that you are interested in. And it's, and it's, it's another good thing that don't just put that with your school is one of the best in the best in the US. Put one future that your school is known for. Like for me, I put that oh, and why all the reason why I'm going, I'm going to upset your school is because. Your school has the biggest knowledge genomic center. So there you see that it's not, not, not specific to their school. That means yeah, you know about the glory of their school. That is why you are applied. So each school has the glory of what they are known for. So don't put that one of the world best or one of the best to study or one of the one wonderful lecture that they know. So they need to know that you know what their school is or what their school is known for. Or you have research. So, it's all about future that, yes, you know your onion. You are good at research. You can also say that you are, you are coming to do a PhD program or a master's program, and you have never done detailed research on your program. So you, that means you're a lazy researcher. And there's another reason to accept you. So that is that on my part. I think I've taken a lot of time. Over wow, to thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for such value you just dished. I mean, it was just so much that I don't know how many people got a daughter to write down so many things. It is just so much value. I mean, you we need to like go and re-listen to what you said again and use it as a template for um, our approaches. And I believe that many people have the same feeling about um, values the speakers have just delivered today.